whose birthday? Yours. Who's going out to dinner? That might be another controversy, so it's okay if he and I get into it, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're having fun. Yeah. Are we having fun, folks? Yeah. All right. All right. Well, welcome to the New Orleans Jazz Museum. On behalf of New Orleans Jazz National Historical Park, we want to thank you for coming to today's program. Usually um, at 2 p.m. we will have a solo piano hour with a pianist, but today we are switching things up. Um, on today we have Barry Martin and Al Jackson. Yes. Um, I would like to call them walking libraries, um, living legends and um, these two are musicians, but also historians in a way. And so I can't wait to hear the stories that they have to tell. Um, Al Jackson, I had the pleasure of visiting his um, this museum called the Petit uh, Jazz Treme, Museum. Treme's Petit Jazz Museum. Treme Petit Jazz Museum over um, in, in Treme. Um, uh, it's near Little Dizzy's Cafe. If you, have, you can two walk blocks. there. Um, and really, t it's a really nice spot, neat spot, so we're so grateful to have these two here. They're going to have a conversation, and I will get out the way again. Welcome to New Orleans Jazz Museum. And on the behalf of New Orleans Jazz National Historical Park, we want to thank you for being here. You take it away. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you guys for coming. You could be anywhere you want to be, but you've chosen to be with us today, and we appreciate that. And they're still coming, look. Good God, we had a, the last concert I did here was about well, I one a month talking about these old time lectures, and me and a piano player was talking about New Orleans before Preservation Hall, and uh, it was just about the same amount of people. So, uh, but we had a piano, and I sing and do I, I play the drums, but uh, not now so much. Well, there's no jobs, you know. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> So doing this for the National Park Service, I was a Park Service, um, what did they call them, ranger at one time. And uh, it was a lot of fun. And I was so glad to see the Park Service come down here. Um, I helped them by, I don't know whether you even know this, there's a place across the, uh, it's called the Dew Drop Inn. It's yeah, across, across the, the lake. Across the lake, yeah. It's an old dance hall from way back. and. Uh, I helped him negotiate that with the lady who owned it. Uh, I knew the lady who owned it. And uh, she was uh, the wife of, uh, let me see, the clarinet player in one of the old bands that used to play there. Oh, what was their name? I'm getting terrible. I can't remember people's name anymore. But uh, it was some brothers. And uh, I, I knew her. And uh, I introduced her to the National Park Service. And they had a, a superintendent here called Gail Hazelwood. And she came over. And the National Park Service bought the hall. You know? Imagine that. They just bought it. Why not? And we played there once a year with a band for some English people. Uh, I was born in England. But uh, hello there. Welcome. Glad you could make it. And um, I played there once a year. It's April the 14th I'm playing there this year with... Uh, a real good band. Dr. Michael White, clarinet. Greg Stafford on trumpet. Yeah. Uh, oh, and the trombone player is a lady. Where is she at? There. Put your hand up. Stand up. Wh take a bow. One of our trombone is from Toronto. Yeah. Oh, I mean she's, from, uh, she's from Toronto, Canada. And uh, Frankie Lynn plays banjo. And, uh, oh, what's his name? She, uh, no, she's Frank bashful. Yeah, she's bashful. <laughs> but uh, most ladies are, you know. Not the ones I know, Barry. Oh, now, 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 now. <laughs> they call uh, them hard-hearted Hannah. <laughs> I told you this would be entertaining. <laughs> but uh, where are you folks from? Who's from anywhere? I mean, Washington, D.C.? Washington, D.C.? Okay. Washington State. Okay. Washington are you, are you State. serious about Washington State? Here's a name for you, yeah. Robert Bl Robert Bumps Blackwell, mm. Seattle, Washington. Mm. Ten I seconds. Mean, I don't know him. Nine. Yes, you do. Eight. Siete. Seis. Cinque. Drei. That's German, folks. 
No, I told you, he's, one. he's way above me in all this stuff. <laughs> he's an international man. Bum <laughs> Robert Bums Blackwell was uh, Little Richard's Tutti Frutti guy, his managing co-songwriter. Seattle, Washington. I never worked with Little Richard, but I've seen him lots of times. Um, I, I've been in the racket for, oh, I don't know how many years now. Um, I started playing professionally. So sorry. That's all right. That's Kamala. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> oh, well, this is entertaining for me, even, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Let me turn this thing off. Yeah, I, would, I was going to say, I would turn it off. You never know who might call. Bumps might call and say, you got that wrong. You know, what was the guy you talking about? What's his name? Bumps, somebody Bumps said. Blackwell. Oh, Bumps Black. Okay, voila. S see, I've got to tell you, I don't even have one of them. Uh, he really doesn't. I don't have Landline nothing. Landline without caller ID. Who the hell is this? It's me, Barry. Oh, Al, that's you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I don't want to be bothered with that. Well, at 81, man, look, I'm lucky. I still got my hair. I told you. And people say, what do you dye your hair with? I don't know nothing about dyeing hair. <laughs> what the hell would I dye my hair? I mean, what the heck would I dye my hair for, you know? But I've been in the racket since, well, I don't know when. When I was 15. And I came to New Orleans first in... Uh, 1961, January the 8th, and uh, I was in Canada, and uh, I only came to come to New Orleans, uh, but they were giving you money to go to Canada at those, oh, those two folks down there are the Canadian, don't you tell nobody when you get <laughs> home. <laughs> but uh, I went in there illegally, listen to this, this is a true story, and uh, it came New Year's Eve, and I said, I've had enough. I'm going to New Orleans. So I walked. I got a bus to a place called Rouse's Point, which is, I don't know where it is, somewhere near Montreal. And I turned right and walked. And then I turned left and walked about another mile. And I seen a man digging up beetroots. And I said, excuse me, is this the United States? He said, what are you, some kind of nut? Of course it's the United States. I said, that's all I want to know. Thank you very much, sir. I walked back to uh, hit the bus down to New York, and uh, I met a fantastic drummer. He's on, in films. He's recorded a million times. Zudi Singleton, Arthur Zudi Singleton, and he's with um, uh, Louis Armstrong in the film New Orleans. And he's been in countless films. And I just called him. Listen at this. I just called, and uh, I got the English accent still then. Uh, now I can't even understand what they're talking about. <laughs> but uh, I said, uh, hello? And this boy said, hello. And I said, is this Mr. Arthur Singleton? And he said, man, who is this? Everybody calls me Zudi. I said, all right, Mr. Zudi. And uh, he said, when, when you want to come over? I said, to your house? He lived at the Alvin Hotel. It was right underneath Birdland. You heard of Birdland. It was a bebop joint. And uh, I went there, and he walked me along this hallway, and there's all these pictures of Louis Armstrong's Hot Five and Kid Ory's band with him in it. And I said, uh, oh, look at this. This is the original, isn't it? And I said, that's Jimmy Bertrand, and so on. So I named all the people. He said, you've been here before. I said, man, this no, I've never been here before. This is a world-famous picture. And he couldn't believe it. And then I met his wife, a little bitty woman, Marge Kreth. She was the sister of Charlie Kreth from St. Louis, a trumpet player. And what a pair. Man, it was so nice. He said, all my friends play down there at Birdland. And he made a record, I don't even know if you know this, he made a record with Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie on drums. Really? Yeah, I didn't know that. he was just, uh, he was a, such a likable man. I've got a picture of him now in my office, me and him. Uh, and, um, oh, he was fabulous. Zudi Singleton, Arthur Zudi Singleton, but nobody called him Arthur. And, uh, oh, he was one hell, uh, one heck of a drummer, you know. But um, then there was drummers down here. Ooh. He told me, he said, 
I, I asked him, could you give me lessons, Mr. Singleton? He said, don't oh, keep calling me Mr. Singleton, Zooty. I said, all right, Mr. Zooty. He said, no, Mr. Zooty, Zooty. God damn it. And uh, I said, okay. He said, but I don't teach nobody. He said, when you get down to New Orleans, you look up a man called Sai. I said, what's his name? He said, Sai. I don't know what his proper name is. And I knew it because I got jazz books. I said, you talking about Josiah Frazier? He said, yeah, they called him Sai. Don't ask. Uh, anyway, I took lessons with him, and I made a film about it. Um, oh, I should... I, I can't remember the name of my website. I'm not very modern. Um, <laughs> BarryMartinJazz.com, I think it is. But you can see the film... I made it. It's called. The, I had the best damn teacher in the world, and that was true. But man, did he work you? He take you. We sit there with him. We made the, uh, a man called Bill Russell. It was a jazz pioneer. He had a store right across the street from Preservation Hall. You know where Preservation Hall is. You been there? Preservation Hall. Anybody? Seven yeah. Seven Twenty Six Saint Peter. Yeah. Between Bourbon and Royal. Well. Bill Russell's shop was right directly across. And I took lessons in there with my teacher, Josiah Frazier, say, and he would make me go over things. He would learn, make me learn polkas and mazookas and all that kind of stuff. I said, well, am I going to ever need this to myself, you know? But now I'm glad I did because I work with all kind of bands, you know, hillbilly bands and stuff, you know. And but now this is this, if I can just inject Barry just mentioned polka and mazurkas and, of course, waltz. You guys are familiar with those three dancing genres, right? Believe it or not, the crux of jazz, the literary part, the theoretical part of jazz, it came from classical music. Did you all know that? Yes. Um, there were young men whose fathers were European, their mothers of Haitian African ancestry or ethnics, were sent to Paris to the Sorbonne to be educated. Those are the guys who brought back the ability to compose, arrange, and rearrange music to Treme. That's real history. I went to the Sorbonne, but only to play music. <laughs> 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 but I did go there. But it was funny when, um, when, we, uh, when I came here, um, I had to, uh, I came here about the third time. The year was November of 63, and I wanted to make a recording with a great saxophone alto player called John Handy, Captain John Handy. Mm -hmm. Best saxophone player I've ever heard in my entire life. Uh, he turned down playing with Fats Waller's band, you know that? Yeah, he turned them down. He said, I didn't want to do all that traveling. He was from Mississippi, just across the state line. And I recorded with him and a trumpet player called Kid Sheik. George Kohler, who lived across the river, um, upwards, uh, not across the river. Oh, I don't know. But anyway, 939 Deslawn Street. There's a plaque on his house yeah, the now. The Canal, the Industrial Canal. But he also lived yeah. on St. Philip Street by Doreen's mom's house. Oh, yeah, but that was much later. Much that later. When I'll tell him about that in a minute. That's a story in itself, believe me. But anyway, um, what was I telling you? Yeah, and Jim Robinson played trombone on this recording. George Gaynor played banjo, Creole, best banjo. Creole George Gaynor. Yeah, he was the best banjo player I've ever heard in my life. Better than Danny Barker? Better than anybody, yeah. Okay. Daniel was a nice banjo player, but uh, he was a better guitar player. I'll tell you a story. Uh, you ain't heard this even. <laughs> but, uh, about, about He's older than I am. That's why I haven't heard it. Yeah, I'm older, <laughs> I'm older than any of them. <laughs> but uh, seriously... Um, we had to go across the river to make this recording. And uh, we, um, oh, it's issued somewhere. I forget what label it's on. Oh, I think it's on the George Bucks GHB label. It's called uh, Jazz at uh, Hope's Hall or something like that. But see, there were the times of segregation. You couldn't, I mean, uh, you know, you, c you couldn't, you shouldn't be recording with black musicians. And what the hell did I come to New Orleans for, you know? I mean, to record London. with black musicians. Well, to play and, with and them. And you did. <laughs> yeah, I did, and to play with them. 
I learned so much, man. I mean, uh, you know, I played with, look, I was the first, I think we were supposed to be talking a bit about this, but I'm not sure what we're supposed to be doing. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> well, that's all right. You You're doing good, Barry. Keep it up. You're happy enough, ain't you? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's my grandma did that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, um, I had to join the uh, union to make this recording. So, uh, well, I was the first um, white musician to join the what they call it in those days, the colored local. No, it was a Negro musician local, 496. That ain't what most people called it, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you. I, I was there. Wait, wh where, where's your union card? Do you know, I should have brought that. I forgot to bring it. I was By Joe's mate? It was a bit rushed. I forgot to bring it. But anyway, uh, anyway, I had to this join. This is what the it union. would look like. Yeah. This is a union card from Local 496, 1968, the year before the two unions were forced by federal mandate to uh, merge. Well, let me let me see that. We got so much water up here. Oh yeah, yeah. My union card looks like that. Let me, can you hear me? Yeah. But uh, I joined the the, the local. Look, in, in the, what they called the white local, I knew two people, Raymond Burke, the clarinet player, and Johnny Wiggs, the trumpet player. Two people in the what they called colored local. I knew the president, the vice president, the lady who sat on the desks, uh, the man who parked the cars, and about 80% of the mu musicians that were in it. So which union would you join? Unless you had crazy ideas like some people <laughs> did, you know. <laughs> but uh, I used to live... I don't know if you folks remember it. Uh, on Bourbon Street, the ladies' legs used to swing out. You remember that? Oh, oh so okay. we know that, well, now we know where you've been. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but seriously, that's, that's, uh, I used to live above there. And it later became Dixieland Hall, which was a, a competition to preservation hall, but never the same. Anyway, you had to go in and uh, up the stairs, and it was uh, around a quadrant. It was about the size of this room, and I lived in the last little building. They never had telephones in the rooms in those days. And uh, the lady was ever so nice. When I got sick one time, she took me and brought me some uh, medicine from the drugstore, so I thanked her. And uh, anyway, I was sitting on the bed. You didn't have television in the room, and in those days, 61, there wasn't any uh, telephones. So she called me. She said, Barry. Telephone. I said, hell, call me here. Uh, all this damn way down. All this was, this was like the distance of this room and then down the stairs. I said, hello. I, knew, I think I told you this, but I'm not sure. It was a, they said, this is an ebony magazine. You know that? You're familiar with that? Uh, oh, okay. Well, I didn't know what the hell it was. But uh, <laughs> uh, they said, um, we understand you joined the colored local. That's what they called it in those days. I said, uh, yeah, I joined the, the Musicians' Union. I had to, because to make a recording. And they said, well, we want to do an article about you. I said, no, man. I said, don't, don't want an article about me. Uh, about what? What the heck would you tell them, you know? So I said, well, I thank you for your attention. I went back upstairs. And about 10 minutes later, the lady called. Barry, telephone. I said, oh, God damn. Who now? And um, I walked all the way down. I said, hello. And they said, this is the clan. If you ain't out of that, such beep and such. <laughs> yeah. Local by sun up or sun down or sun rise or some sun. We can come raise your voice a couple of octaves, you know. And I said, uh, listen, you gentlemen. I said, when you come, you got to come. Up the stairs, there's no lights. You've got to walk all around a parapet. There's no lights. And I, in those white robes, I can't miss. I've got a shotgun. <laughs> I said, I'll blast you, gentlemen, one by one, because you can only come single file. They never came. <laughs> no, that was... Uh, but just to get a phone call like that, can you believe it, you know? Well, let, let's let's Barry mentioned the union. So let's for a moment, if you guys don't mind, can we have a little brief conversation about the local union, local four ninety six? Yeah. 
But I've got to ask a question first. I'll give you three names, and by a sign of hands, you can tell me which of the three, number one, number two, and number three, would become the, the most famous musician in that particular room. Can I vote? No, indeed, man. Your oh. name is in the mix. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> Your cousin did. My uncle, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead on now. <coughs> Lorenzo Tio Jr., number one, Barney Bigard, number two, and Louis, Louis Daniel Armstrong, number three. <laughs> Which one joined the local, not in New York, not in Paris, in New Orleans? And, uh, everyone agrees with that? Aha. Uh Aha. -huh. Uh -huh. Competition. Okay. Barney Bigard or Lorenzo Tio Jr. Okay. So we have Bigard and Lewis. So let, by show of hand, let's, Tio was born in Mexico, became a great professor of music, but he was not in the union, unfortunately. So let's show of hands for Barney Bigard. Oh, wow, not too many. I think Lewis won by acclamation. And you're right. He did not join the union in New York City. And the only proof of that apart from his house, probably. His house museum is in that book in front of you. Lewis was a, un a union musician, <coughs> but there's been so many narratives written and or spoken about Lewis. Some may or may not have been quite accurate, so if you guys would afford me a couple of minutes, I'd like to clean some of that up. Lewis Daniel Armstrong, I was not the OBGYN. What's that mean? I don't know. I just read that some damn way. <laughs> I don't even know what that, anybody know what that means? O Y B J N. Who? Gynecologist. The baby doctor. The baby doctor. Oh, okay. <laughs> I only met mine once. <laughs> but no, I didn't. He, my mother was thirty-six hours in labor, and she told my daddy, "Never no more children." And uh, so I've got no brothers and sisters, you know. It's lucky, huh? <laughs> so Lewis was born, was born by midwife at his grandmother's home in a place once we once called Jane Alley, which was back a town from Treme. The city demolished that property in order to construct a police headquarters. Hello. We love you, Lewis. In Paris, that is. <laughs> I went there to that building. It was still going in 1961. Eddie Richardson, the trumpet player, black trumpet player, used to live right in that same little thing. Mm -hmm. I went there to Lewis's house. Yeah. And I was looking like this, and the lady came out. And she said, what you looking at? I said, I, I understand Lewis Armstrong was born here. She never said who she was. Uh, I never did find out who she was. <laughs> but she said, uh, yeah, he was born right here. And I said, well, there ain't no plaque or anything. She said, you got a plaque? I said, no. I said, uh, you know where I come from, there'd be a great big plaque. Lewis Armstrong was born here. One, one would have thought. But New Orleans is a funny city, man. You know, I mean. Uh, yeah. So <coughs> by, eight, by age 18, he left the home of his grandmother and moved in with his mother. Today we call it the Central Business District. And proof of that, and again, I was not the, the sergeant of the military, the, the re recruit, so recruitment, recruitment sergeant, but on the table you can read Louis Armstrong's draft card from World War I. Yes. The birth date, date of birth. You guys ready for this one? 4th of July, 1900. Not the 4th of August, 1901. Now, I don't get into a tete-a-tete, -tete, as I mentioned earlier. I'm not, I was not the OBGYN, so I don't lay claim to having delivered Lewis. And I was not the draft recruiter, so I'm only going by what his mother signed her name to, and everything else checks out. He was a musician in Storyville, working for the mob, followed by the name of Peter Lala. So it all checks out. Now, of course... Uh, this is also at my at my jazz museum. It's, it's, most of this is on the wall over there. Folk have brought to my attention, well, Mr. Jackson, 
The name is spelled L-E-W-I-S. Well, if you were an Anglophone as opposed to a Francophone, you would spell Louis L-E-W-I-S as well. And a spy, right? Ta-da. Kind of, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but let me tell you, I played Louis's 70th birthday party Where? with my band. It was at Where? The at the Preservation Hall? Preservation Hall. Shucks. <laughs> uh, uh, um, okay, Ben Jaffe doesn't like you. It's okay, though. Oh, he, he's, uh, I knew his daddy. Played his daddy's funeral. Yeah, his daddy was a sousaphone player. Yeah. But anyway, it was at the Shrine Auditorium. You folks heard of that? The Shrine Auditorium. In Lo Anybody from Los Angeles? Well, you know the Shrine. Is it still up? That's your homework oh. assignment. Come back next year to let us know. <laughs> I played it Lewis's 70th birthday in there. And my English band... We played it, and there was all kind of stars on it, you know, you wouldn't believe. Uh, Benny Carter, Barney Begard, uh, oh, God. Benny Carter was great. Yeah, sure. So was Barney. I wrote a book on him. But uh, uh, but anyway, um, Lewis, we finished our act, and there was the stage is where you folks are, and then there were some curtains here. And I'm sitting here looking that way, and Lewis was sitting there. But he he didn't know that I was sitting there, and I didn't know he. Well, I knew he was sitting there. You couldn't miss where he would be sitting, you know. And the promoters came, and they were talking in my curtain. The two promoters, they said, "We're going to have to tell Lewis to cut his act down, because uh, after twelve o'clock, it was about I don't know twenty minutes past uh, eleven, and after twelve o'clock the Price goes sky high when they had to, you know. So we're going to have to tell Lewis to cut his, his act down. And he heard it. And he got up and he walked. How many ladies are here? Well, a lot you of ladies, ladies. Mind your mouth. You ladies. Mind uh, your manners. No, you ladies block your ears because <laughs> I'll tell you, I was there. Lewis walked on stage. It's on a record, actually. It's on a uh, GHB label, uh, Lewis Armstrong's 70th birthday. He walked on the stage. As soon as he walked on, you know, there were 6,000 people there. And he said, man, that was a long, I won't use the whole word, that was a long effing walk. <laughs> That's what the man said <laughs> to all these people. And they just cheered, you know. And uh, I yeah, got proof of that. From the you know? old yeah, he was uh, just a nice cat, man. I mean, I went to see him when I was a little boy several times. Never thought I'd play for his 70th birthday in the Shrine Auditorium. I had an old black band called the Legends of Jazz, which they literally were, you know. All New Orleans boys. And um, I was the youngest one in it. But, uh, man, we toured all over the world. Whenever we played for that boy, uh, what's the name of that boy who was married to Grace Kelly? Anybody remember him? French Rainier. Yeah, you know him? Yeah, we went to school together. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They told me, they said, if you do a show with this man, you've got to watch him because he's going to tell lies. <laughs> and I know that was one because he never went to school, period. <laughs> but anyhow, that's all right. We're glad you're entertained by us crazy ones. But, um, yeah, I played for him, Prince Rainier, and, uh, um, oh, I played for a lot of them people. And uh, oh, well, I lost the train of my thought. What was I going to tell him? But uh, I got Lorenzo Tio. You were talking about the union. I'm gonna have to get this to your jazz museum because he joined the union later. I've got 75 witnesses. Did the, the, the say he didn't join the union? No, that you promised to give something to me. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> well, no, I'm a man of my word. You know, look, take this. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, Barry. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, I got his union card. I think it's dated 1931. I got it at home. Okay. It's in my book. I wrote a book about Barney Begard, the clarinet player. He was a wonderful clarinet player. And uh, he had a white wife. He was taught by the best. Oh, he's... Well, one of the best. Lorenzo yeah. Tio Jr.'s father was a clarinetist as well. That's and right. His father and family left the waters and migrated to Veracruz, Mexico, just before the Civil War began to escape New Orleans' racism. So he, Lorenzo and his brother Luis were both born in Veracruz, Mexico, and came home after father transitioned and became professors of music. 
and taught a lot of these Creole cats how to play. Theory was important, but drill on theory. But well, anyway. Let, let me see. That he taught, Lorenzo Tio taught Omar Simeon. I don't know if you all heard of him. Sidney Bechet. Sidney Bechet. Yeah. Rashid Bache. Now, so who's from New York? By that area, New Jersey. Anybody? Yeah, Jimmy Durante? Anybody? Jimmy Durante's Dixieland Band? No one knows that? Well, well, Jimmy Durante hired Ashil Bakay, whose great great nephew owned Lil Dizzy's restaurant. But Ashil Bakay was a saxophonist and clarinetist, and he performed with Jimmy Durante in New York City until he retired. Yeah. It's funny, there are different musicians that you work with in your life, you know. I work with so many, but I can't think of who. But uh, one of the greatest I ever worked, you worked with. You worked with Jean Louis Francois Zenon. Who's he? George Lewis. Oh. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, I'm supposed to plug this book. Well, there it is uh, right there, Barry. Can you hand me a copy of that book there? Please. 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 Okay. Mind your manners. You're a good man. These British blokes, man, I tell you. I don't <laughs> care. This, this is a book I wrote on George Lewis, and uh, there's a CD in it, and uh, it um, it's a fabulous book, I must say. I wrote it with his late manager, and uh, you can... It, it really is a good read. And the CD on, on the back on the back cover is worth the buy. And this, um, there's a lady. Where's that lady? There, she's gonna come there and sell them. I, I don't know what <laughs> she's selling them for. I don't care. But listen to this. Uh, can you read? Yes. Oh, well, that was, was my reading glasses. Oh. So you want me to read something? Yeah, just what? this little paragraph here. Oh man. Wait a minute. He's going to get organized. I told him he was coming to a lecture, but... Uh, you didn't ask me a, a reading se about a reading session, but that's okay. I ain't Put got any reading glasses. Put, don't smoke that cigar. No. Let's see. If not, we've got some young eyes. Right, Toronto? All right, now. It's only, it's only about three sentences. It doesn't matter this. the quantity, but it's the quality of the deliverance. The, the, the <laughs> by, by, oh, Nick Gagliano. No, me. Why are you? Well, because I'd say... Ah, the joys. <laughs> he's the nice joys. to work with at most <laughs> times, but today, I don't know, he must have drunk so much coffee. And it was Haitian coffee as well, with a little voodoo in it. <laughs> okay, the George Lewis Ragtime Band with the most exciting ja was the most exciting jazz band I've ever heard. It's said about everybody. Yeah, but okay. it's true. The seven it's pieces that. generated so much in the way of ever-shifting patterns both melodically and rhythmically, that is hard to describe if you've never heard it live. The band brought nothing, nothing but joy to millions of people all over the world. That's true. For those who have so many sense of aesthetics, no explanation of the music is necessary. For those who do not, no explanation is possible. That's right. That was one heck of a band. Barry? Thank you. <laughs> what? No, not me. I'm talking about the the band. They were all, all friends of mine. Oh, I should have brought. I, I did, there's a magazine, English magazine, called what's it called? Just Jazz, I think it's called. I had a picture of George Lewis, this clarinet player, played with Bunk Johnson and had his own band for years, holding my little son when he was just born. Wow. He's a year old. No, not a year. A month, I mean. And George is holding him. George loved little children, you know. And uh, I'm so proud of that picture. And the magazine just published it. And um, it was fantastic to see that. My son ain't seen it, but he's my son is 56, I think. He, he's a drum player too. And my other son uh, is uh, 52. And what does he play? He plays piano and guitar. And, but they play rock and roll stuff mostly. But they play Dixieland. See, there's, look. The, all the musicians down here called it Dixieland. But the people from away say, you shouldn't call it Dixieland. But that's what I've been calling it all my life. You know? It's Dixieland music from down in Dixie. Yeah. Or traditional jazz, take your pick. I mean, uh, sometimes you catch hell from uh, playing. My band was called The Legends of Jazz. Anybody ever hear of it? Anybody ever want to? <laughs> 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 they got you, huh? 
Oh, okay. But, um, and we had a hey, band let bus. Me, let me give the folk another kudo about Louis Armstrong. And thanks to the city. Sometimes it takes a while. But in 1968, two years prior to his death, Louis Armstrong was invited to perform at our local jazz festival. So there was only one jazz fest where one would have seen Louis Daniel Armstrong in 1968. No, the first jazz fest was celebrated in 1949. The first time he was invited? First time yeah. on record that he was invited. He was quite busy. He was, he was a very, very busy musician, traveling all, about, all over the world. But he accepted the invitation. Uh, at the same time, we celebrated two, the 250th anniversary of the founding of the city of New Orleans. So it was really apropos that Lewis should be here. And he did stop his schedule and accepted the invitation, and voila. We have one of the Jazz Fest posters that you can pick up at Tremaine's Petit Jazz Museum. You should go there. That's a, I mean, not just because he's my friend, but uh, never mind about that. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a really good place to go. I've been there lots of times. and uh, But I've got to tell you one story. We're talking about uh, Tony Parenti, the clarinet player. He's from New Orleans. White clarinet player, Italian. I guess he's Italian. I would have named him Parenti. He must be, you know. Yeah, he was Sicilian. And my friend, the one I first told you about, Zudi Singleton, the colored drummer, uh, they were invited to play the first jazz festival. Well, I played the first jazz festival. It was in 1968. They want to have you believe it was in 1970. It was in 1968 and 1969. I know because I was there with my band and I played it both years. Well, and 1970 it was, was jazz and heritage. Yeah, well, that's I don't the know. difference. I don't know nothing about heritage. I'm just sharing with uh, you. That was that they changed the name when 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 George Vine or George Weed, depending on your pronunciation, came down at last to to actually take over the jazz festival. Oh yeah, he was the a name good was guy. changed from jazz festival to jazz and heritage festival. Yeah, he was a good guy. He was a piano. Yeah, he player was a great too. guy. Piano player. The guy he also founded the uh, Newport Jazz Festival as well. That's right, George Vine. Anyway, let me finish this story. We had. Um, You're not finished. We, we took. <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, there's a nice man to work with, but he's a little, <laughs> you know, his mind don't work as quick as it should. Don't tell everybody. <laughs> and he's younger than me. <laughs> but anyway, look, we um, we went. We took our brass band out to meet uh, Zudi Singleton, and Zudi Singleton and Tony Prandy, both from New Orleans. One was black and one was white, and they were on the plane. Uh, I mean, that flew in. And we started to play this when the good old days when you could play in the take the band right to not on the tarmac where the you know the plane people came off what what they call that uh, the hall where they enter. So we started playing. I don't know what probably Saints or something like that for Zudi. And Tony Brandy came and shook hands. He said, "It's so nice of you to get the brass band out for me for him." We didn't even know he was on the damn plane. <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> Didn't even know he was on the plane. <laughs> but that's how, uh, but he was a nice enough guy. He was from New Orleans. And, uh, well, most of the musicians are from New Orleans and nice guys. I mean, uh, but it's funny, you get, I, I never told you this, let alone anybody else. But I played a show, um, let me see, who was it for? ABC, I think it was. Yeah, it was for ABC. I forget what it, the show was called, but it was at Storyville, the club on opposite. Uh, where's Storyville? It's still Fri running. It's not called Storyville anymore. The one in the quarters? Yeah. Where? One night at Jack's, right up here. That's what it's called now? Oh, okay, well, it was called Storyville. We played there, and uh, we gave up our seat because they had um, Ray Charles, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis and Fat Domino. Wow, piano night. Yeah, piano night. And Ronnie Woods from the Stones. Huh? Ronnie, Ronnie Woods from the Stones. He <coughs> was there? Ronnie Woods. I don't know him. I just know, I just know the original Rolling Stones. Oh, wow. You, you were was there? there? How old are you again? <laughs> <laughs> Look, stand up and take a bell. Let the people see you. Hey, Barry. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So anyhow, <laughs> they were there, and uh, and the boss man came and said, um, let's uh, wind it up with all three pianos playing together. We played something simple. 
we played Jambalaya on the bayou. And Jerry Lee Lewis said, what can you play that in? And uh, Fat Domino said, B flat. And uh, Jerry Lee Lewis said, oh, man, I'll play it in A flat. And uh, neither one of them was good enough musicians, I'm telling you what I know, to transpose. And Ray Charles just sitting there like this, poor man is blind. You know? <laughs> and he said, I, I can't use the words he said, but you can imagine. <laughs> one starts with M and one starts with F. He said, he said, when you gentlemen <laughs> make up your goddamn minds, it's so I can get out of here. He said, uh, so the, the, I forget what they settled on, but I think he played it and he sang it too, Ray Charles, you know. I've seen him lots of times when I was a little boy playing in London, went to concerts of his, you know, and Pat Domino too. He used to live up the street and I'd take people by his house. He lived about half a mile from where I live. And he's sitting out on his porch every night, every not every night, every day. And I'd take friends of mine, tourists, by there and uh, hit the horn, hey, man. And he'd, hey, he was just a pleasant man. He wasn't he very was. educated, you know, but <coughs> he was such a pleasant man. I was so sorry when he died. But, um, yeah, he's a, he is a really, I don't know what you call the music he plays. Some people call it rhythm and blues. Some people call it blues. Some people call it jazz. But Pat could play with practically any band, you know what I mean, and make them sound good. And he had such a nice personality, too. Yeah, he really you know. did. He was a very nice chap. He always smiled. I mean, if he was playing for you, he'd, he'd, he'd be like this, you know. Oh, my teeth don't fall out. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> no, he, he'd be smiling all the time. That was his manner, you know. And it always worked because he always charmed the audiences, you know. That was the only time I worked with him. I went to see him lots of times when I was... I went to see everybody in when I lived in London till I was uh, 19, 18, I don't know. And I went to see every American act I could, you know, and there was lots of them. I mean, you can't just be into one form of jazz and just like one form of jazz. Well, you can, but it's it, it don't, uh, you know, I like watching the modern jazz quartet. I didn't understand them too much, what they were doing. But uh, Kidori's band, now they came. Kidori's, I played Kidori's funeral. Did I ever tell you that? I sure did. Did I? Yeah. Oh. See, he's my confidant. <laughs> that means he's very confident. <laughs> but uh, seriously, I played Kid Over's Funeral. I've got to tell you this. We were, it was a, a band called the New Salutation Brass Band. And it was run by a trombone player. Oh, he's dead now, what the hell. He didn't want too good. I won't tell you his name. That's the best thing. But, uh, and um, we had to, go up the hill, and the two drummers, um, Alvin, uh, oh. Alcorn? No, um, oh. Oh, not Alcorn. No, no, no th th this is a, uh, anyway, the, the, the two drummers were exhausted. They couldn't walk up the hill, you know. And so, um, Alton Purnell, you heard of him? Alton Purnell. Alton yeah. Purnell was my piano player in the Legends of Jazz, and he said, this boy plays a bass drum, let him play. He played good. So the band leader, who should remain nameless, said, listen, he said, you ain't going to know the first number we played, so don't be playing nothing on that. I said, okay. I wonder what the hell they were going to come up with. I mean, I thought, maybe it's some great march I've never heard of. Guess what it was? It was Creole trombone. <laughs> Man, I've been playing it all my life. <laughs> and so I just played with them and... Uh, so I played Kid Ori's Funeral. I was lucky. Uh, well, so was he, I guess, to get a bass drum player who could play in 6 8 and walk up the hill, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but he was a nice man. We went to meet him. They announced he was coming when he toured England. He had a band with Red Allen from New Orleans on trumpet. You heard of him? Hen Red Hen Allen? Henry Allen? Henry Red Allen from Algiers? Yeah. yeah. yeah father and son. Yeah. They had him. Uh, Red Allen, a white guy called Cedric something, played clarinet, or did he play piano? I, I don't, can't remember. So it was 1957, I think, 56 maybe. 
and uh, we went to uh, meet uh, the band. They had a big brass band. They always had a brass band play, like I told you about Kid Sheik coming. And, uh, but Kid Ori and his wife, who was a white lady, I forget her name now. You remember her name? No, I don't. Okay, well, they came the day before. And, uh, and the rest of the band stopped in where the boat landed at Southampton. And so there was only about six of us there to meet Kid Ori. And I shook hands with him. Um, this is before I saw him on the concert stage. I was, I don't know, I was just about probably 14 or something like that, you know. But to shake hands with Kid Ori, I couldn't believe it, you know. And then when we went to the concert the next night, the whole band was there with Red Allen. Uh, he was a good friend. And uh, it was funny, i got to tell you this. I was on tour with, you ever hear of a trumpet player called Kid Thomas Valentine from Algiers? Well, he and Emmanuel Paul, the tenor player with the Eureka Brass Band, I was on tour in Europe with them two, with my band. And uh, when I came to New York, we toured with a band called the Easy Riders, which are anything but, but that's what they were called anyway. And uh, we toured with them, and we had a night off, and we went down to see Red Allen's band, you know. And Red Allen and Kid Thomas, they're both from Algiers. Right. Well, how many people is there in Algiers? Even now, there ain't that many, you know. <laughs> and so they knew each other. And uh, so it, it was the funniest thing. Kid Thomas was a little bitty tiny guy with a high-pitched voice like this. You could hardly understand what he was saying. And Red would have a big voice like this, you know. It was a hell of a pair. I'm, I mean, a heck of a pair, I'm telling you, you know. But they were yapping away there, you know. I couldn't understand what they were saying. I really couldn't understand how for because I was born in England, you know. But they were... And your Ivanix wasn't too good back then. Well, it ain't that great yes, now. missed that one. Ivanix, come on now, where's the laughter? <laughs> I, I'm, I missed it too, but I was, you know. But um, they told me, uh, they said, you should do this show with Mr. Al because he's a very serious man. But I ain't found him that way. Well, Have you? Thank you, you Barry. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing I did find, and I mean this sincerely, with all my heart, he knows what he's doing. I can't imagine anybody else running that little Creole Jazz Museum, you know. I've been there several times and took people there. He certainly has. He's been a big supporter since 1997, a long time. 1997. So he called and said, I need you. I said, Wh when and where? Yeah. Here I am. The museum's yeah. closed. I'm here with Barry. And then we we come here to, um, wait a minute. Oh, good God almighty. Your time passes so quick when you're having fun. I mean, I'm not kidding you. We've got about another 15 minutes to talk. You think we'll make it? Sure. <laughs> how, many, how, many of us, how many of us are familiar with the name Peter Davis? Oh, boy. So who said one, one eye Jack was for everybody, right? Who said that? Yeah, who said that? Who, Lewis's teacher? Okay. What about a cap? What What about Captain Joseph Jones? Have you ever heard of him? You and I know to him. Yes, you have. Are you serious? Who? Captain Joseph Jones. Joe Jones is a drummer. You ain't talking no, about no, him. No, 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 no. That's the guy who recorded "You Talk Too Much." You worry me to death. No, this but this chap Joseph Jones predates Lewis, and he's on that picture. Standing uh, on on oh, on the, the left yeah, side, yeah, yeah, of, yeah, uh, yeah. Louis Armstrong, Peter Davis on the other side, but Captain Joseph Jones was a musician from Trimay in 1898, Spanish American War, and it was he who gave Louis that first trumpet. It was he. It's downstairs. We got his first instrument from, him, and it was he who Peter Davis referred to when Louis was stumbling, because he in fact was a musician with military band experience for the United States Army. And no one knows his name. But that's just a little history for you guys, you know. It's good to have fun, but it's good to have a little factual information. I was a little fact taught here and there. So everybody collaborated to help Lewis become what he is today. 
But well, that's a good thing. Lewis, what he become today is a complete legend. You know, he's a. Even when I played his seventieth uh, birthday, he was a legend then. I mean, he packed the Shrine Auditorium. Anybody know the Shrine Auditorium in Los Angeles? Anybody been there? You, you. There's two of them. Well, you know how many it holds. It's a great big place. You well, know. Just think about his trip to was it Ghana or Kenya? It was Ghana, but in Ghana, when his presence, the war stopped. The war, in fact, said, stop fighting. Lewis is in town. Let's go to a concert. Like, what? <laughs> How do you do that? <laughs> Where was Tony Blinken, right? <laughs> he ain't making this stuff up either because uh, <laughs> how would he make it up? He runs his jazz museum. He's got to be factual. What's the word? Factful? No. Tactful? No. Factual. Factual. Yeah. Thank factual. you over that. Thank you. It's multi-civilic. I okay. told you he's a smart <laughs> cookie. See? <laughs> You <laughs> came up with it. But uh, do me a favor, put that book down there, would you, on the table with those. Can you? Uh, i got a stick. I will. Come? I will. Okay. And um, anybody got any questions? Sometimes the people want to ask questions. Yes, sir. No. Oh, yeah, man. I knew you were going with that. But you almost sucked him into it. Yeah, you almost did. Uh, yeah, yeah. Pete. Actually, Pete Fountain is on that Jazz Fest poster, 1968. Did you know that? Before you leave, make take a look at it. Pete Fountain's on it on Jazz Fest poster. Pete was. Um, I used to work for the George Buck Foundation uh, above the Palm. What's that place? Palm called? Court Cafe. Yeah. 1204 Decatur. A decade to it. Well, the GHB was run by a good friend of mine, George Buck, George H. Buck. I don't know what the age is. And his wife, was. Nina. Well, I don't know her too well, but... Uh, <laughs> She's a Brit. <laughs> yeah, but so is the king, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. You know, but Poor anyway, Nina. where do I get to? God damn, the only thing to do in the show with him, uh, you get confused sometimes because uh, you think, well, I don't know what I was talking about. Uh, <laughs> George Buck. Oh, George Buck. Yeah, but what was I going to tell him about George Buck? He was a nice guy. Oh, yeah, he was a wonderful guy, and he did a lot for jazz, you know. He really did. But, um, yeah, I used to work there. I was working there for, I don't know how many years, uh, 40 years probably. In fact, when I first met him, George Buck, I was coming down from New York to New Orleans on the first trip. This was uh, just after New Year's 61 before a lot of you was born. <laughs> and uh, he called me, he said, Mr. Martin, uh, this is uh, George H. Buck. And I said, wait a minute, you want my daddy? He's not here with me. He said, oh no. I said, well, what the hell are you calling me Mr. Martin for? <laughs> but he, that's the way he was. He was very respectful. Very. He was blind, yeah. you know. Anyway, he said, I hear you're coming down. Are you coming anywhere near Atlanta? And I said, um, well, yeah, I guess. I don't know where the bus goes. It's a 48-hour bus trip in those days, you know. Wow. And uh, buses were still segregated. He couldn't believe it, you know. So he came on the bus, and uh, the Klan had a rally to stop the buses and all this. This was January of 61. And they got on the bus. I don't know. They were looking for what they call freedom riders. You know what they yeah. are? Yeah. I'm damned if I did. I don't know what they were looking for. You know, I thought they meant people just getting on the bus and not paying the. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know anything about the politics over here or at, at the time, you know. But anyway, they got on the bus and uh, looked all around. And, and then uh, George Buck met me at the. Uh, he was blind, as I told you. And um, the funny thing was, uh, we went back to his house, and he had a great big house. And um, of course, he knew where everything was because he'd walked around. It's like walking around this stage. You'd know where this. What what is in this, by the way? Oh, it's bottles of water. Alkaline right. water. Oh, okay. It's healthy. Alcohol and water. Alkaline. Oh, it's healthy. Anyway, <laughs> I never <laughs> never never touch this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, um, where did I get to? Um, yeah, we went back to George's house, and he said, I've got, 
I know you know this cat, Butch Thompson. Anybody heard of him, Butch Thompson? Piano player? Somebody has over there. Where, where are you from? Oh, okay. Well, then you must know Butch because he, he's from Minneapolis. That's pretty near you. <laughs> 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 but he's a real good piano player, you know. That, that's right. Yeah, I worked the show with them too. Harrison Wheeler. Um, no, what's his name? Garrison Keeler, yeah. I don't know if that's uh, a relative down there, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, how else would they know the name? Yeah, Garrison Keeler. But Butch played with them in later years, of course. But this was, he was in the army and he was stationed at Atlanta. And George Buck said, we got a, we got to have a big party here tonight. I said, oh, great. You know, and I'm looking at this little house and I said to myself, a big party? They're going to have a party in here. Where are they going to go on the lawn? And it was January, you know. But his idea of a big party, he was blind, bless him. But uh, he, he had uh, Bush Thompson and me and Charlie Borneman. Anybody ever heard of him? He was a trombone player. He was pretty good. And uh, we all drinking this Jack Daniels. And uh, uh, all three of us musicians. And George didn't drink nothing. He drank about one beer. And we were getting this away, you know, and then George said, why don't you play some music? Play some music? We could barely see what the instruments <laughs> were. <laughs> and he had a drum set there because he was a half a, um, uh, uh, half posterior drummer, you know. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Anyway, he, um, he had a drum set, so I played the drums, and you never heard anything like it, you know. Three drunk, crazy loons playing together. We had a ball. And he said, I recorded it. And I said, what? He said, oh, I'd love to put it out. I said, you can put it out right now. Put it outside the door. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to put that out. I said, no, man. I said, we were all drunk as hoot owls. But uh, that's how he was. But he was a fabulous guy. And he had that big, right over, uh, what's the name of that place? The Palm? Palm Court Cafe? Yeah. He, uh, I worked up there. For f I was with him for forty some years, you know. But uh, I've had a wonderful life. I never regretted anything. I mean, I just uh, I played for two presidents. Uh, huh? One? How do you know? Oh, I thought you said one. I was going to oh say, but well, I, I don't make <laughs> things up, you know. Which presidents? Ronald Reagan and Gerald Ford. Played for Gerald Ford in Grand Rapids. I got a letter home from his wife. And it signed, what was his wife's name? Betty, Betty yeah. yeah. And uh, you folks know more about it than I do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and she says, Jerry also, listen to this, Jerry also sends his regards. Jerry, that tickled me. But when you go, I'll, I'll tell you this, and then, um, well, if we go five minutes over, they won't mind. Uh, <coughs> But then Al was well, speak, finish Speaking up. of presidents, uh, anyone familiar with Papa Celestine's band? 1953, Dwight Eisenhower yeah. hired them to perform with Jeanette Salvon, Marvin Kim Kimball's wife on, on piano. Yeah, she 1955 Jazz Fest participants as well. Well, let me tell you, when, they, when you get a, are uh, uh, you interested in this? I mean, I don't want to be wasting your time. Well, what else you got to do? Where you going to go? <laughs> <laughs> one eye jacked, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah. But seriously, first you, you get a letter that uh, then they come to, well, I don't know. But when you go to the White House, we were playing at Ford's Theater. That's where they shot that boy Lincoln, you know. And uh, because Nancy, every on the film, there's a film of it. She keeps looking up to the box, you know. But... Uh, <laughs> But it was a funny, it's a funny old theater. Anybody ever been there? Ford Theater? You been there? You ain't the one from Los Angeles, are you? No, Seattle. You played there? No, I saw him. Yeah. He's from Seattle. Was there, but I saw him <laughs> oh, you saw a play. I'm sorry. I thought she said I played there. I was going to say, God dug it. How old are you? Two, 214, you know? Stand up and take a bow. You're older than me. <laughs> God, God Almighty. But anyway, when you go there, and then you, you have to go to this box, and they sort of look at your passport. 
And then you go to another box and they look at your moon. Anyway, you go through four and then you go into this room. It's about the size of this. It's like an Indian restaurant. It's called the Red Room. There's red carpets and red ceiling and red. And, uh, and there's two big doors. And here comes a waiter, Mr. Martin. And I said, yeah. I don't know how they knew I, who I was, you know, but it's like coming to say Mr. Jackson, you know. Mm. And they say, uh, Jack Daniels will bought a back, isn't it, sir? How the hell do they know what you drink? <laughs> but they know. They're just telling you, you know, we know all about you. Before <laughs> you. So I said, thank you very much. Then the door's open, and in comes Ronald Reagan. And he says, I'm so pleased you could come. He's pleased. President of the United States. <laughs> I'm shaking his hand, and he's pleased. <laughs> but then... Uh, in comes Nancy, and she's completely the opposite. She said, Ronnie, that's what she said. R I swear to God. She said, Ronnie, you don't know much about jazz, but I can't wait to hear you guys play. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what she said, Ronnie, you don't know much about jazz. But, uh, and it's it's coming out on a, on a film. Uh, there's a man making a film about me. I don't know why, but he's, he's doing it. He was supposed to be here today, but he ain't here, I don't think. He's there? Oh, <laughs> I'll be hogtied. Anyway, good job I didn't see you was there. I'd have been nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I get so nervous on shows, you know. <laughs> but um, anyways, you folks uh, had a good time? I'm sorry you got to leave, but I'm going to leave soon myself. We'll see you <laughs> next time. <laughs> All right. But uh, where did I get to? Um, yeah, pl uh, play for who? Oh, about Ronald Reagan, yeah. And uh, when you play that uh, Ford Sierra thing, you know, it's, it's a great experience. And playing for the President of the United States, my God, you know. But look, just in closing, because people are starting to go now, and I've never had an audience walk out on me in my life. <laughs> 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 Screw a few times, Barry, it's okay. They said... Um, they said, you've got to be serious for these people. I said, I am serious. Sir. Everything I do is serious, you know. But seriously, I want to thank you for coming along. I want to thank the National Park Service for putting this stuff on. I don't know what they do with the films, they, but they do something with them. They put them on some, I don't know what it is. But on their uh, website. Yeah, on their website, I guess. Yeah, I don't and know. should thank the uh, Louisiana State Jazz Museum as well. And thank the, uh, who are they? Louisiana State Jazz Museum, <laughs> Gary Lambuzi? Yeah, right here. Greg Lambuzi. Yeah. yeah. Greg, Greg, Greg Lambuzi. We thank nice look, chap. We thank everybody. Most of all. He's a proper bloke, you know? Most of all, <laughs> give yourselves a hand for coming. <laughs> and now, brother, brother Al Jackson. Look. Thanks for coming, folks. Thanks a million for coming, and we wish you all a very happy. Uh, what is it coming up? Christmas, isn't it? No, Thanksgiving, Halloween. Ha Halloween? Halloween is next. All right. So take care. We're glad you came. <laughs> All right, guys. Oh, and if you want to buy a book, you see this girl with the hat on here. Yeah, lady. Lady, I mean.